Sean Finnegan, and you are listening to Restitutio, a podcast that seeks to recover authentic Christianity and live it out today. Tribalism is a major problem in our society today. Would you agree? If we're honest, tribalism is a major problem in Christianity today. And if I'm really honest, I have to admit that tribalism is a major problem in me today. Do you feel it too? Are you tempted to blow your ideological, theological, or political enemies out of the water when they say something ignorant or obviously wrong? Are you tempted to lump people into a group, label them, and stereotype them? As our society has increasingly become polarized on issues from the environment to immigrants to sexuality to wearing a mask, we must resist the temptation to get sucked into tribal thinking. In the end, we are the church with a commission to reach outsiders with God's love. Now, how can we do that if we circle the wagons or worse, cast stones? Here now is episode 441, Tribalism in Times Like These. I want to tell you about a a kid. He went to the store and was looking at a Red Sox jersey and decided that he wanted to get that for his birthday, that he'd like to pick that out. And he told his older sister and she smacked him in the back of the head and said, what's wrong with you? We're a Yankee family. Go talk to your mother. So he went and he talked to his mother and he said, well, I got this jersey and I'd like to get this for my birthday. I'd like you to get this for me. And so she immediately smacked him in the head and said, what's the matter with you? Go talk to your father. So he went and talked to the father. He said, dad, yes, son. Got this jersey. I'd like to to get it. And his father smacked him in the head too and said, no son of mine is ever going to wear that, that filthy team. So they're driving home, and the father says to the son, I hope you learned something here today, son. And the son says, yeah, I, I learned something. And his dad said, well, what would you learn? He said, well, I've only been a Red Sox fan for an hour, but I could tell you what, I hate you Yankee jerks. <laughs> so that's a little bit of a taste that we have of tribalism, right? You've got the, the Red Sox tribe who are obviously wrong, and then you have the Yankees tribe, who are obviously superior. That's tribalism, saying that uh, because you're part of that group, there's something wrong with you, or because you're part of this group, I'm going to show you favor, even though you might be a total creep. So that's kind of like a, a, a fun little illustration of it, but it gets more serious than that. Look at Judges chapter 12, verse 1. We read, The men of Ephraim were called to arms, and they crossed to Zaphon and said to Jephthah, Why did you cross over to fight against the Ammonites and did not call us to go with you? We will burn your house over you with fire. Okay, that's kind of weird, but what what it I don't have time to read all of chapter eleven. It's actually a very long chapter, but what happened in chapter eleven is Jephthah was called upon by the the people of Gilead, that's the village in which he lived, the area of Israel where he lived, and they said, Hey, these Ammonites are raiding us. We need a warrior to lead us in battle against the Ammonites. So Jephthah did did that. He succeeded. He defeated the Ammonites. And now the tribe says to him, why didn't you ask us to come with you? What's what's the matter with you? You went and defeated the enemy without us? We're going to burn your house over your head. Friends like this, right? I mean, (laughs) you don't even need any enemies. All right, verse 2, And Jephthah said to them, It's all right, guys. You know, I'm sorry. Let's work it out. No. Verse 2, He said, I and my people had a great dispute with the Ammonites, and when I called you, you did not save me from their hand. And when I saw that you would not save me, I took my life in my hand and crossed over against the Ammonites, and the Lord, or Yahweh, gave them into my hand. Why then have you come up to me this day to fight against me? So Jephthah says, look, I already asked you guys for help. You didn't show up, yet I was still able to get this victory because God helped me. Verse 4, then Jephthah gathered all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim. So the the men of Gilead and the men of Ephraim, these, these are all Israelites. These are all people that are supposed to be on the same team. Verse 
4. He gathered the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim. And the men of Gilead struck Ephraim because they said, You are fugitives of Ephraim, you Gileadites in the midst of Ephraim and Manasseh. Those are tribal names, in case you didn't know. Verse 5. And the Gileadites captured the fords of the Jordan and the Ephraimites. And when any of the fugitives of Ephraim said, Let me go over, the men of Gilead said to him, Are you an Ephraimite? And when he said no, they said to him, then say Shibboleth. And he said Sibboleth. You see the difference? This is, this is kind of like a funny thing about Hebrew, but it's, it's this one letter in Hebrew, and it, it's called a Shin, and it, it looks like a W, you know, just like with a line in the middle, capital W. Uh, and if you have a dot on one side, it makes the sh sound, and if the dot's on the other side, it makes a s sound. I don't know what you do if you've got a lisp. You're just on the sh side the whole time. But So they said, say Shibboleth, and they said Sibboleth, for they could not pronounce it right. Then they seized him and slaughtered him at the fords of the Jordan. At that time, 42,000 of the Ephraimites fell. Verse 7, Jephthah judged Israel six years. Then Jephthah the Gileadite died and was buried in the city of Gilead. So what is this? This is, this is tribalism. This is a way to figure out, are you part of my, my in-group, or should I kill you? This is essentially the equivalent of asking a New Englander. It's hard to beat up on these guys so much, but uh, to ask a New Englander, say the word car. Right. And if he said, ka, you'd kill him, right? This is essentially the same thing. You know, some people say shibboleth, some people say sibboleth. And uh, if you said it wrong, they killed you because they knew you were part of the other tribe, part of the other group. 42,000 people died in this conflict. I don't know if they all died right at that moment on the, the river. I think you could read it a couple different ways, but that's still a lot of people that died here. In their book, The Coddling of the American Mind, Lukanoff and Haight wrote the following, and I found this to be very insightful. They write, neuroscientist David Eagleman used functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI, to examine the brains of people who were watching videos of other people's hands getting pricked by a needle or touched by a Q-tip. So you can either get uh, needle pricked or touched by a Q-tip. So if you get touched by a Q-tip, it doesn't hurt, right? We're all on the same page. Needle bad. All right, when the hand being pricked by a needle was labeled with the participant's own religion, so there's an insider, the area of the participant's brain that handles pain showed a larger spike of activity than when the hand was labeled with a different religion. When arbitrary groups were created, such as by flipping a coin, immediately before the subject entered the MRI machine and the hand being pricked was labeled as belonging to the same arbitrary group as the participant, even though the group hadn't existed just moments earlier, the participant's brain still showed a larger spike. We just don't feel as much for those we see as other. Now, this has nothing to do with your character. It has nothing to do with your education. This is just how we're wired. We're wired to have more compassion than just the way the brain works when we perceive someone as being part of our own group than when they're part of another person's group. Now, in the beginning, the way God set the world up, we read about in Genesis, we were all part of the same group, right? So this, this would actually work really well. Because <laughs> if you think of yourself as being part of somebody else's group, you have more empathy and more compassion. You feel their pain a lot more. Uh, however, things changed. I'd like to read out this them versus us statement that Jesus dealt with in Mark chapter 9. John said to him, this is one of Jesus' disciples, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. What is that? <laughs> so there's somebody that's doing the good work of the Lord, and they're doing it in the right way. And it's working. There's no indication here that it didn't work. Like, there, there, was, there were people out there casting out demons in the name of Jesus. And Jesus' disciples saw it and they said, whoa, 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 whoa. You're not part of our group. You can't do that if you're not part of our group. That's our group's thing. 
Verse 39, but Jesus said, do not stop him, for no one who has done a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me, for the one who is not against us is for us. The one who is not against us is for us. So Jesus' own disciples, they saw somebody doing a good thing, and they said, because you're not in our group, you're doing a bad thing, because you're unauthorized. But Jesus, Jesus defends this guy. Let's go to Luke 9, verse 51. This is probably the strongest example in the Bible in the New Testament. I mean, maybe you could think of a stronger one, but uh, this one definitely always comes to mind for me. On the subject of tribalism and this, this sort of group identity that, that comes into play, Luke 9, 51 says, When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. This is talking about Jesus. He's, he's getting ready for Passover. He's going to go to Jerusalem. Eventually, he's going to, during this time, he's, he's going to get arrested and, and crucified and re- raised from the dead. All that's about to happen. The time is drawing near. Jesus is up in Galilee, which is north, and he's got to go through Samaria to get to Judea, which is south, and he's traveling through. And we read in verse 52, And he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. That makes sense, right? If they didn't have the Internet, I mean, we would just do that on our phone. We'd, we'd get a reservation. Have you ever done this? Have you ever taken a road trip where you didn't figure out which hotel you're sleeping at because you wanted to figure, you wanted to see how far you could go before you got tired? Uh, Ruth and I did this uh, a couple of years back, and we were, I don't know how far we got. I thought it was pretty good, though. Maybe like Virginia, or I mean, it was pretty, we were going straight south from here, and uh, it, was, it was getting late. So we're looking up the hotels on the phone. And then we call, and my wife only cares about one thing. Let's see if you can guess what it is. In a hotel, she doesn't, no, she doesn't care if it's clean. I'm sure, well, she probably cares if it's clean, too, I guess. She's in the other room. Don't tell her I said that. Uh, what, what do you think she wants? A shower. A shower, yeah. Well, they all have showers, though. Right. No? Hot tub. There it is. Pool or hot tub? Or both, if, if possible. See, the thing is, we're going with kids. So if there's no pool, there's no fun. You know, I mean, that's, that's really what matters. So I'm calling all these places ahead of time, and I'm like, hey, do you have any vacancy? And they say, yeah. I said, do you have a pool? And they say, no. And I said, all right, well, thanks. So then I call the next one, and the next one, and the next one. And so this is kind of a similar situation here in the sense that they're going ahead and they're not asking about a pool, but they're asking about, do you have a room where we can sleep, where we can stay tonight? And he sends out these messengers ahead of time because it's not necessarily an easy thing to do when you're in a foreign area to know where to go. And they're asking around in verse 52, verse 53, but the people did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. So Jesus is going to Jerusalem, his disciples are going to Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is the temple, and the Samaritans absolutely to this day, the Samaritans are still alive, by the way, to this day they despise Jerusalem. They hate Jerusalem, they think the choosing of the city of Jerusalem as a place for the temple is the fall of Israel. They they believe that that was the moment when Israel lost its faith in God and fell away. And uh, so the Samaritans believe that Mount Gerizim is the place where the temple belongs, not Jerusalem. And that everyone that thinks Jerusalem, they're all wrong. They're, they're innovators. They're heretics. Jesus is on his way to worship at the temple in Jerusalem. And these guys get wind of it and they say, well, you can't stay here. Now, just to, just to play a little fair for the Samaritans, it was a Jewish king that destroyed their temple On Mount Gerizim. So the Samaritans had good reason for bad blood. But anyhow, they treat Jesus, they basically reject him, say, You can't stay here. Can you imagine that? Taking a road trip in every hotel that that, that you try to contact, they find out, Oh, you're from New York. Oh, we don't let New Yorkers stay here. That actually happened to um, uh, Chuck. Chuck Camello was driving home from Florida. And uh, when COVID hit, and it was big in New York, but it wasn't, of course, now it's big in Florida and not big in New York. So it's exactly opposite. But he's like halfway up the East Coast, and he's, he's already got a hotel, and they see his license says New York on it, and they said, we don't want you around here, and they kicked him out. 
Uh, and that's what's happening to Jesus. How does Jesus deal with it? Verse 54, and when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? <laughs> this is like one of those moments where I wish we had tone in Scripture. Like, is that a serious question? <laughs> I have every reason to think it's a serious question. But he turned, verse 55, and rebuked them, and they went on to another village. Jesus is like, you know what? Instead of calling down fire and like executing these people for their rudeness, let's just try the next town. <laughs> and so they go to the next town, and you know, we don't really have much more information about where they stayed that night. But what is that? That's tribalism. That's the, that's the mentality where the Samaritans say, you guys, and the Samaritans believe in the first five books of the Bible. They believe in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They believe in Moses. They keep the Sabbath. They keep the food laws. You can't be more similar than that. They don't believe in the prophets and the kings. And yet that's enough for them to reject these people and to say, you can't stay here. We don't want your kind around here. And getting rejected is enough for these uh, Israelites to say, should we call down fire? I mean, Jesus, you've done a lot of healing. This is, just think of this as like a reverse healing. We'll unheal them. Jesus rebukes them. So tribalism is really bad at its worst because it, it results in a lot of bad treatment of other people. You think of the times in human history where there's been really rampant evil Think of like the 1500s to the 1800s where Europeans transported 12 million Africans uh, to become slaves for life. I mean, what was that? That was tribalism. That was us saying we have our group, you have your group, you're the slave group, we're the, the traders or whatever, uh, the merchants. Between, and then in between 1941 and 1945, the Nazis killed over 6 million Jews. Two-thirds of the population of Europe, they liquidated of the Jewish population. Why? Why do they kill the Jews? Because they are part of a different group. We are the Aryans and you are the Jews, and so they killed them. Uh, same thing happened in Africa, right? It turns out in 1972, the Tutsi army in Burundi slaughtered 120,000 Hutus. I, I had not realized that before. So the Tutsis had slaughtered the Hutus to the tune of 120,000 in 1972. So then in 1994, they flipped, it, they flipped it. The Hutus slaughtered the Tutsis, 800,000 in 100 days. And one of the things the Hutus did is they went, they went around and they found all the moderate-leaning Hutus in the leadership. They rounded them all up and they killed them first because they didn't want anyone of their own tribe speaking against what they wanted to do. 800,000 people died in 100 days. Also in this book, The Coddling of the American Mind, they mention when the tribe switch is activated, we bind ourselves more tightly to the group. We embrace and defend the group's moral matrix, and we stop thinking for ourselves. In tribal mode, we seem to go blind to arguments and information that challenge our team's narrative. We just lock into what the group says, to what the group does, and we go with the flow. Have you seen this in, in recent times? Just a little bit? <laughs> a little bit over here, a little bit over there? This is what's happening over and over again. There is this hit of excitement when you do these rage statements, right? And where you defend your group's mindset of this or that particular issue. And then everyone else pats you on the back and says, yeah, I'm with you. Those idiots over there, they don't know anything. Right? That's that, okay, we're policing our boundaries, and that's tribalism. But the Bible has, thankfully, a solution for us. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 2. We are not left with just bad examples. There are lots of examples of tribes and tribalism in the Bible. Of course, there are the 12 tribes of Israel, right? And each one of them had their own identity. And there were sometimes civil wars that broke out between the tribes. If you read in the book of Judges in particular, what was it, uh, Bethlehem that almost got destroyed completely? Uh, which is amazing that they had the first king. When you, when you think of how they were almost completely wiped out. The tribe of Dan had a really uh, tough time. No offense. Sorry about that, Dan. But uh, Dan got a positive mention in the announcement, so I just want to take him down a notch that his tribe wasn't the greatest uh, in the book of Judges, at least. 
But, uh, you know, there's a lot of tribes, but then there's the, the division between the Jews and the Samaritans. But really, the biggest division in Scripture, the biggest division, people division in Scripture is between the Jews, Israelites, really, the descendants of Abraham, and then what? The Gentiles. That's really the biggest division we see talked about throughout Scripture because God had chosen Abraham and his descendants and, and had worked with them and had bound himself to a covenant with this people to work with them. And out of them came the Messiah, Jesus, right? Whereas the Gentiles, you, you see a little bit here and there where uh, a, a Gentile like Rahab will come in to the community of faith or uh, Moses' father-in-law. You know, he gets a positive mention, or Melchizedek, he's not from the Abrahamic people. You know, so there's, there's some scattered examples of God working with people among the Gentiles, but there's not really that much. His primary focus is the descendants of Abraham. That's who he's working with. That's who he makes all these promises to. And so when we read in Ephesians 2, what Christ has accomplished, it really really makes a big difference. Look at this, verse 11. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. I don't know if your version puts quote marks around where it says the uncircumcision there. The ESV does. Yeah, it's, it, this is a bit crass for Sunday morning, but it's not really the word uncircumcision. There is a perfectly good way to say that in Greek. It's, it's actually the word for, for uh, foreskin. It's like, it's like excessively, you know, Vulgar. vulgar, thank you. Thank you. It's like, it's, it, it, it's like going around and saying, oh, yeah, you guys were foreskin, we're uncircumcised. And it's like, okay. But that's, what, that's how they saw it. Like, there are these people, or there are these. That's why they put it in quotes, the uncircumcision like that, because it's not really the word uncircumcision. But no translator's got the chutzpah to uh, put the real word in there. So, and neither, neither, neither do I. All right, verse 12. <laughs> Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ. Just talking about the uncircumcision, the Gentiles, anybody that's not descended from Abraham directly. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, whew, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Look at verse 12. I mean, that is incredible. An incredible list of bad news for non-Jews. Hey, that rhymed. Some bad news for non-Jews. <laughs> Strangers to the covenants of promise, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. What else did it say? Without hope? Was that in there? Having no hope without God in the world? I mean, you're just external. God's been at work in the world through all these centuries with all these different people we read about in the Bible. And as Gentiles, we're just excluded. We're outsiders. We're not part of the tribe. And then in verse 13, we get a big but. But now... But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. That's a huge, huge truth. And this is, this is really the knife that slices through tribalism. We're about to see a reconciliation, a, a, a tearing down of boundaries and of walls and a unification made possible. I think a lot of us think, okay, you just bring the Gentiles in, and now they're part of the Jewish situation. It's actually bigger than that. It's not described in this verse, in this chapter, as, as just grafting in. Yet we have been grafted into the promises, but he's actually made one new kind of humanity out of the two groups, which is even bigger, I think. Verse 13, But now in Christ, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace. Amen. Huh? Who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Did you know that in the temple there was a wall? There was a physical wall in the temple in the time of Jesus when it was still standing. There was a physical wall there. It was not too high. You know, it was like... A, you know, they called it a balustrade, you know, like it's, you know, three, four feet high. I'm not sure exactly how high, but you could see over it. And that's where the Gentiles had to stay behind. You had to stay behind that wall. And they found two inscriptions from that, that wall that were from the time of Jesus that, that said, if you cross this wall, if you're a Gentile and you, and you pass this wall, you'll have only yourself to blame for your execution. 
And it was the only exception the Romans gave the Jews to execute anybody. That's why they had to go to Pilate for Jesus. They couldn't execute Jesus. He didn't cross the... That was like the only... The only thing you could do is if you cross that wall and enter the Jewish part of the temple courtyard, then they could kill you. Other than that, you've got to ask for permission. What does it say here, verse 14? For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. This wall also is how Paul ended up getting a mob attack. You know when that, what that mob was going to do to him? That mob was there to kill him. Those of you who know about the incident with Paul, Paul had gone into the temple area. Paul's a Jew. It's no big deal. He's paying for the vows. This is like Acts 22-ish, somewhere in there. He's paying for the vows for these guys that are having this ceremony and everything. And somebody says, oh, we saw Paul bring a Gentile in past the wall. That's what, that's what lit the, the explosion that ended up in a riot in this mob. And they're, they're starting to, to, to uh, beat Paul and like... They're going to tear him to pieces. And then the Romans intervene, and that's the only way Paul survived. That wall Jesus has taken down. Verse 14, he has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. There is no more wall. There's no more wall. Verse 15, by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new Man or one new humanity in place of the two, so making peace. We're not talking about a person, we're talking about a way of being, a way of being a human being. There's the Jewish way of being a human being, and you don't eat certain foods and you have certain days, right? There's, you guys understand that. And then there's the Gentile way, and the, the Gentiles had worshiped all these other gods, and they had all these statues and all this other kind of stuff at that time. And now he's taking from both of those and he's making one new humanity, this, this new idea called Christianity. It's pretty exciting. Verse 16, and might reconcile us both, Jew and Gentile, to God, in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Isn't that just a tremendous truth? These divisions, they've been torn down in Christ enabling us to, to be unified in a way that was never possible before. We see this play out in Scripture, right? In the book of Acts, what, what do we find? We find uh, Philip preaching to the Samaritans. And his sermon to the Samaritans is not like, you guys are wrong about everything. Pfft. No, no, he preaches Jesus to them. He preaches the kingdom to them. He preaches the name of Jesus Christ to them. In Acts chapter 8, and they get baptized, and they receive the Spirit, and they join the church, right? I mean, it's this huge, you know, the apostles even came to see it. Like, did you say Samaritans? Do we offer membership to Samaritans? <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, we offer membership to Samaritans. They're well, even to this day. Any Samaritans ever watch this? God bless you. We'd love to have you join. You know, we love Samaritans. We want Samaritans. We want Jews. We want Gentiles. And then uh, later on in chapter 8, Philip goes and he preaches to an African, the Ethiopian treasurer, a very significant person, probably surrounded by bodyguards, I would imagine, if he was a treasurer, probably had some treasure. You know, Philip, and he goes and he preaches to that guy, and he, and, he, and, he, and he brings his Christianity down to Ethiopia. And then in chapter 10 uh, of Acts, this might be the mo most mind-blowing of all these crossing over boundaries that we see in the book of Acts. He preaches not only to an Italian. I know, you're thinking, Sean, not the Italians. Yeah, well, the Italians were basically in charge of the world, and they were essentially the problem with the world. It's called the Roman Empire. And... Jews did not like the Romans because they were the conquering nation, right? Not only that, but this guy was a centurion. He was in the military. He was, he was the boot on the neck of the Jewish people. But yet, he wanted to know. 
He had a heart that was open. He, he, he loved the true God, had learned the true God by some uh, association with the Jewish people that he was, he was uh, working among. God had to give Peter, you remember all these visions he gave Peter? Those of you who read this, where he had the sheep come down and all these animals, and, and, and he said, and the, the voice comes, rise and e- kill and eat. And Peter's like, oh, this is a test. I got this. I don't eat unclean food, Lord. This never come into my mouth. Peter's like, I am a good Jewish boy. I am not going to eat. I'm not going to break kosher, even in a vision. Even though I know it's not real. I'm still not eating bacon. <laughs> then it happens again, and then it happens again. Right? Three times it's established, and then suddenly he gets a knock at the door, and it's people that are sent from Cornelius, this Roman centurion, and he hears the Spirit say to him, Go! Go with them. And he goes, and it is the best evangel. This is almost, uh, I would say, yeah, even probably better than the Ethiopian. The Ethiopian guy was about as easy as it gets. He's up there. He's reading the Bible. He's reading like the, the clearest prophecy in the whole Old Testament about the crucifixion of Jesus. And Philip's just like, do you understand what you're reading? <laughs> like that, <laughs> that's pretty darn easy, right? It's even easier for Peter. The uh, people he's trying to evangelize to, they come to his house and ring the bell. Can you preach to us? <laughs> When's the last time that happened to anybody? Can you imagine ringing a Jehovah's Witnesses uh, doorbell? I'm here to be preached to. <laughs> so they go, and Peter, he, 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 just, he just starts preaching in the middle of the sermon. They all believe the Spirit falls, Pentecost happens again, they speak in tongues. There's no resistance at all. From a perspective of tribalism, this is crossing over a huge line. You've just invited Romans into the church. And it doesn't stop there. In Acts chapter 11, we see that now we have a church in Antioch where you've got Jews and Gentiles eating together. This is a real big deal, and they figure it out. And they've got a couple of there from Africa. They've got some well-connected, wealthy people. They've got normal people. They've got Jewish people. They've got lots of Greeks. And they're figuring it out, and they're doing community together. They're crossing over these boundaries. Scripture, for us as Christians, I'm not talking about the world. The world's going to be what the world's going to be, all right? I'm not going to suggest some way to fix the whole world. Jesus is going to fix the whole world, okay? I'm talking about us. Christians here. Now, when it comes to those who us who, who dare to name the name of Christ, who say, I believe that he is the Messiah, I believe that God raised him from the dead, I believe that he's coming back to establish the kingdom. Those of us in that, in that category, that when it comes to us, we have to put our identity in Christ above the other stuff that we care about. That doesn't mean we don't care about other stuff. I think, it's, I think it's good to care about other stuff, but it's secondary. Because if it's not secondary, what are we doing? We're like uh, brick builders establishing and building up new walls. You're like, oh, well, those Christians over there, they're idiots. And we over here, we're enlightened. That, that's not a move for us, okay? That's not a move for us. Christ has broken down the wall of hostility. Let us not... Put it back up. Now, some people might say, Sean, yeah, I hear what you're saying, but it sounds like colonialism. It sounds like you're saying you, you just want to have everyone think the same as you. Well, there's a big difference between colonialism and what we're talking about here. Colonialism is where you say, okay, well, you have to speak English, and you have to wear this kind of clothes, and you have to eat this kind of food, right? That's colonial. That's not Christianity. Christianity is cross-cultural. If we looked at a map of the world, we'd see that there are Christians spread all over the world, speaking all different kinds of languages. This is very unusual. This is very unusual. If you're a Muslim, you're supposed to read the Quran in what language? That's right. I mean, there are translations, but they're frowned upon. You're supposed to read it in Arabic. If you're Jewish, you go to synagogue, guess what? They read it in Hebrew, and then they translate it into the language of the country that you're in. Unless you're in Israel, in which case they just read it in Hebrew. Christianity is not like that. We have it in all these different languages, right? We have all these different nationalities. We have all these different kinds of people that are are part of it. And we're not saying to people, you can't eat French food if you become a Christian. 
Or you can't eat Italian food if you become a Christian. Or you can't eat Jamaican food if you become a Christian. That's not what we're saying. Eat your Jamaican food, but bless it in the name of Jesus Christ. Right? You see what I'm saying? Like, Christianity is, is, is really the only thing I know that can bind us together across all of these other secondary things. It's not colonializing, it's, it's uniting together. We have a common view of creation. We have a common view of what went wrong with the world. We have a common view of how God has worked in time to save the world through his son, Jesus Christ. We have a common view of what God's going to do in the end, at least the broad strokes of it, that ultimately Jesus is going to come back. You know, these are, are what unite us together. And so some, of, some Christians, they eat fried chicken. Others don't. Some people speak Spanish. Other people don't. Some are Republicans. Some are Democrats. Does it matter if you're a Republican? Of course it matters. Does it matter if you're a Democrat? Of course it matters. Are these important issues? Yeah. But they're secondary to being a Christian. I even have a Christian friend who's an anarchist. Still not even sure exactly what that means. But you know what? He's a Christian. And I love him because he's a Christian. And, you know, I might disagree with his view of uh, politics. Basically, he says there should be no government. Uh, some days, it, 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 it kind of makes sense. But uh, that's secondary, his radical views. Some people believe that the, there should be no government interference at all in economics. That's called pure capitalism. Other people uh, who are Christians believe that the government should redistribute all the wealth. Pure communism. And then, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's very few, actually, I'm either of those extremes. Most people believe it should be some sort of a mix between where you pay taxes. That's the middle position. But then we argue about, well, how much? Where should it be? That's important. I pay tax. Do anybody else pay taxes in here? Yeah, we pay. That's important. We care about that. But it's secondary to our identity as Christians. You could be a Christian garbage man, a farmer, a retail worker, an office worker. You can have White skin, black skin, brown skin, whatever other color skin there is, I don't know. Uh, you could be a, a patriot for your country. You could be cosmopolitan and say, oh, we're citizens of the world. You know? And you're still a Christian. You could listen to rap music and be a Christian. Did you know that, Rich? There's actually Christian rap. There is, yeah, believe it or not, yeah. You can, you can be a Christian and listen to heavy metal. What? And, and we all know you could be a Christian and listen to country music, right? Because country music is already Christian to start with. <laughs> Let's look at uh, another verse to close out. At Galatians 3, 27. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. That's a huge statement. There is neither slave nor free. Another big one. There is no male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. In our time, we have different divisions. We have different ideas that, that we care about that divide us, right? But these were theirs. These are their categories in their world. Whether you're a Jew or a Greek is something that you're born into, and there's nothing you can do to ever change it. He says, not in Christ anymore. You're one, whether you're Jew or Greek. Slave or free, so you could be a slave and be a Christian. You could be free and you're a Christian. Male or female, I mean, that's a huge divide, especially in their culture at that time. He says, no, 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 no. Neither male, no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So what am I saying? I'm saying that within the faith, there's a huge space for diversity for variety, for disagreement among ourselves about how this should happen or what color the carpet should be or, you know, other things that, that you know, how you raise your children or how the country should be run. These, all these different things, right? Where you want to go for lunch or how, how you want to handle, you know, all the, the craziness that's going on in the world right now. You know, there's a range of views, Right? And I'm not saying these things don't matter. They do matter, but they don't matter as much as Christ. That's what I'm saying. Christ is better. Christ is more ultimate than these other things. Now, it is true that Christianity is a group. 
And I'm talking about tribalism, so I got to address this just you know, as a way of closing here. That we do have a boundary. In, in the scripture, let's see if you can pick the other side. We have the sheep and the... We have the righteous and the... We have believers and... We have the saved and the... Yeah. That's true. We do believe that there's a boundary, that there's a group, and that you're in it or you're out of it. We do believe that, which means we can become tribalistic. The moment you have a boundary, you can, be, you can, you can start saying, well, all those people just don't know anything. Right? That's, that's the, the danger of it. But the, the brilliance of the Christian boundary is that it's an open system. We have a boundary, but it's permeable. And what I mean by permeable is that Jesus left us with a mission to make disciples of, what, one, one nation? All nations, right? There would be disciples that people would be welcome and invited in from all nations. Not everyone's going to join, we know that. But we want to have the open doors to allow people to come in, even if they're mired in sin, even if their politics or, or other views are, are wildly different than mine or yours. Right? We want to still welcome them in and really put the focus on Christ because that's the glue that holds us together as the body of Christ. Wouldn't you say? So within Christianity, we could be opinionated. I'm opinionated. Anybody else opinionated? <laughs> I admit it. <laughs> we could be opinionated, but we do also have this, this guideline for ourselves, which is, Acts 17, 11. Now, these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. This is the Berean mindset. And as Christians, we have, we, we, we must do this over and over and over again. As we encounter different ideas and different positions, and we have that relative or that friend or that colleague at work that's pushing this or that on us, what do we do? Do we just say, oh, I don't know? No. We take it to the scriptures. We examine it. Examine the scriptures, right? Daily. Huh. Examine the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. That's our protocol as Christians when we come across ideas. And, you know, like I said before, the world's going to be what the world's going to be. Let's, let's have our love be an example as believers, Let's have our love towards each other be an example. And then we can look at, all right, now how do we think about people that are outside of our group, that are outside of Christianity? What is our posture towards those people? I know. It's to set them all straight. To tell them all the ways they're wrong. To tell them that they're just useless and they're idiots and they have nothing to contribute to society. No, that's not our posture towards outsiders, right? What are we supposed to do to outsiders? We're supposed to love them too. It's a lot harder to love them than it should be to love each other. But we are called to love them and to invite them to become part of God's family. Well, this brings this message to a close. What did you think? I know this is a major issue for me in my heart today that I have to stay vigilant about and that if I do nothing, I'll just get sucked into the polarized thinking that surrounds me. It's in the air, it's on social media, it's in the movies. Everybody is seeking to lump, label, and attack. Friends, I'm just convinced that Christ didn't allow himself to get sucked in, and we have to find ways to reach across, even with people that disagree with us, even with people that are taking wrong positions that we would not compromise on truth, but that we would be able to have any kind of respectful dialogue at all, which I think is really the key to persuasion, respectful dialogue. Well, anyhow, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Come on over to restitudio.org and find episode 441, Tribalism in Times Like These, and leave your feedback. On episode 438, Is God a Trinity of Persons? Someone named Rob wrote in, Great teaching, Sean. At 4820, you say that the Father never says to Jesus, My God. Any Trinitarian worth his salt will immediately quote Hebrews 1.8 to you. Well, Rob, let's go ahead and read Hebrews 1.8, which says, 
But of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. This is an important text that, of course, I'm very familiar with and that I have a lot of thoughts on. I don't want to say everything about this right now, but uh, I will I will say just two things very briefly. One, this does not contain the words, my God. So uh, I think my statement is vindicated on, the, on those grounds. My, again, my statement was that God never calls Jesus my God, whereas Jesus does call the Father my God. But uh, that seems to be a rather minor semantic point in light of uh, this text that you raise here, Rob, so I appreciate that. One is that there is a translation issue here, and some people do prefer the translation, God is your throne, and uh, that is certainly a possibility in either Greek or Hebrew, where this is quoted from in Psalm 45, verses 6 and 7. Uh, I, I don't tend to go in that direction. In fact, I like that this is a verse that calls Jesus God. I think it's actually really helpful uh, because in the original context, Psalm 45, the person speaking is a poet, a court poet, who is exalting one of the sons of David, one of the kings of Israel, not Jesus, not the Messiah originally in Psalm 45. And you can take a look at that yourself and see that it's actually a wedding ceremony, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. You've got this uh, this beautiful woman uh, decked out at the end of it, and they're getting married. It's a it's a beautiful it's a beautiful psalm. It's a beautiful piece of royal poetry, and in the psalm, the psalmist is comfortable saying to the king, the human king, "Your throne, O God, is forever and ever." The scepter of uprightness is a scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. So this bespeaks of a secondary usage of the word God, where a human being is called God because that human being is standing in for God, is standing in as God's authority. And what is more authoritative than a throne? And so the king is sitting on God's throne, as it were, on earth, in Jerusalem, and as such, can be properly addressed as God. And I know this sounds really weird to our Western ears who look at the word God as only useful for the name of the Father Almighty, but that just doesn't do justice to the biblical data. I mean, think about it. In 2 Corinthians 4, 4, Paul is able to call Satan the God of this age. How are you going to call Satan God? We find Jesus himself making a case in John chapter 10, verses 34 and following, as Theophilus Josiah pointed out, the Rosetta Stone for idea of agency, that Jesus says, did not the law say that you are gods? And if he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and so on from there. And so this is a phenomenon in Scripture. And uh, as I've pointed out in previous episodes, every lexicon indicate every, every lexicon that I've ever checked has this as a definition. Whether it's an old lexicon, whether it's a new lexicon, whether it's Hebrew, whether it's Greek, they all recognize that this is a, a genuine, authentic usage of the word God in this secondary representative sense that God's agent can be addressed as God. And I I think this is actually really helpful for us because on another verse, John 20, 28, where it's a lot clearer that Jesus is being called God there, uh, that this this gives us an option for interpreting that. And I I don't want to get into John 20, 28 right now because that's a whole other subject. But hey, Rob, thanks so much for writing in and bringing this text to our consideration. Next week, we've got Pastor Daniel Calcano of Ontario, Canada, who's going to talk to us about generations. And I believe there is a lot of polarization there, too, sadly, where we think that our generation just sees the world perfectly, clearly, and without any kind of bias, or maybe if we are biased, the best kind of bias. And 
people from other generations are either outdated or newfangled and therefore erroneous. And so this is not really the best way to look at <laughs> generational differences. And Pastor Calcano is going to help us think through that next week. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. If you'd like to support Restitutio, you can do that at our website, restitutio.org. We'll see you next week. And remember, the truth has nothing to fear.